Good morning, Calvary Chapel young people. How's everybody doing today? I know you must be excited. The church is opening this Thursday. Sunday, and uh, we get to, a lot of you will get to come and worship together with the pastor. Mm -hmm. I know Pastor Brian is very excited about uh, starting church services again, so let's all make sure we uh, lift him up in prayer tonight, and uh, just look for an exciting Sunday morning. So we are still in Texas. We won't be able to join you in Half Moon Bay. And it's going to be a little bit of time before we can actually come because we got to make sure we're pretty careful with our health. But um, we're glad to be here. Uh, we miss you. We look forward to seeing you in person. But we feel really blessed that we're able to stay connected with you like this. So if you remember from last week, we studied about Daniel's friends. Daniel wasn't in the story last week, but his friends were, and they were in a very dangerous, a very scary situation, and yet they had great faith, and, and they showed their faith, and we learned about God's faithfulness to them. We learned that God is truly all-powerful. Yeah, we did. And we learned that God can save those who follow and obey him, and, and that by faith, we choose to trust in God no matter how difficult it may get. And that's a decision we make. We might not even feel like it, but we decide that we're going to have faith in God. Today, we're going to learn about pride. And pride's, pride's a sticky thing for people. We will learn that God has given us everything, including our talents, our time, anything that contributes to our ability or our opportunities to feel pride. But when we feel pride, we really have to honor God because he is the one who gave us all of those resources, all that opportunity. And we've got to give him the credit and the glory. And if we don't do that, we dishonor him. And in today's lesson, we're going to see what happens when human pride overrides uh, God's laws and obedience to God. And it's... Uh, it's, it's going to be a tough story, but uh, I think we all have to learn from it. So let's uh, start off with prayer. And if you would, please. Lord, lead us. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful that uh, this Sunday morning we can come together as believers, worship, and just praise you. Uh, we really want to lift up our pastor. I know... It's been a deep burden on him not being able to uh, have uh, the church body meet. And he is just thrilled that he is able to do this starting this Sunday. So let's all pray for him. Let's all lift him up and just give all the praise and glory to God for allowing this to happen. Uh, so we, again, we're just excited. We thank you for the opportunity to come and worship. And Julia and I thank you for the opportunity to share with our young people. Uh, we wish we could do it face-to-face, uh, -face, but this certainly is uh, second best. And we hopefully we're doing a good job presenting your word the way you want it presented. So... Uh, Bless what we do, guide and direct us, and let us just uh, say thank you for allowing us to share in the young people's lives of our church. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So today's lesson comes from Daniel. We're still in the book of Daniel, and um, we're reading from uh, chapter 5. Chapter 5. Would you get us started? Yes, and we're only reading excerpts of chapter 5. We're not reading the entire chapter, uh, but just the highlights. Uh, we would encourage you to sit down with your parents and read the entire chapter. Uh, I think you will get a lot out of it. So we start off in uh, verse 1. Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast for a thousand of the lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring gold and silver vessels, which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken 
from the temple which had been in Jerusalem that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Now we see that Nebuchadnezzar has died and the new king is the son of Nebuchadnezzar. And one of the, we see at the very beginning his arrogance because the vessels that he's referring to that his father took from Jerusalem were to be used only in Jerusalem at the time of certain worship services. So he was dishonoring God because they were toasting gods of wood, stone, gold, and silver. They had a God for everything. So he was dishonoring the holy God and uh, we will see as we go through the price he had to pay for that. So those things that he was using in his party, and he was having a big party, those were intended for use in worship. Only in, in the worship. temple. Yeah. And here he is, he's throwing a party. Okay. So moving on, starting at verse 5, in the same hour, the fingers of a man appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote then the king's countenance changed his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other and the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers the chaldeans and the soothsayers and the king spoke saying to the wise men of babylon Whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. So the king was pretty freaked out. I, not, I think he was scared. I think he was he scared. He was really scared. I think he was really, really scared. His countenance, that means his face and his whole way of being. Can you imagine standing at the party and you're having a great time and you get so scared that your knees are just knocking together? And, and your hips loosen, which means you, you, you lose your balance. You, yeah. you, you maybe are going to fall. Yeah, he yeah. was pretty frightened. Then the queen, because of the words of the king and the lords came to the banquet hall, the queen spoke saying, O king, live forever. They always say that. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. And she saw it. There is a man in your kingdom in whom the spirit of the holy God, it's interesting she uses the word holy God, mm -hmm. and in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of gods were found in him. King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, the king made him the chief of all the magicians, the soothsayers, the Chaldeans. So she recognized Daniel. She, she remembered Daniel. She remembered Daniel because she was closely related to King Nebuchadnezzar. Sure. Then Daniel was brought in before the king, and the king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard of you, that the Spirit of God is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. It's amazing how both the queen and even the king recognize there is a God and he's powerful but they refuse to follow him mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, we see that today that a lot of people know there is a God but they just refuse to follow him they think he's wise but they don't need to they don't need him yeah yeah Okay, we're continuing in verse 16. It says, And I have heard of you that you can give 
interpretations and explain enigmas. Enigmas means unusual sayings or words. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck, and you shall be the third ruler of the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself, and give your rewards to others. Yet I will read the writings to the king and make known to him the interpretations. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and your majesty and glory and might. Honor. Now we see that Daniel had no need for purple robes, which is a sign of royalty, or gold. His reward was with God, and he knew that God wanted him to do this interpretation. So he was doing it for God, not for King Belshazzar. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. So we see... Here is the most powerful king, Nebuchadnezzar. In the high, he had honored God at times, but then he let his pride take over when he built the statue. Right. And he, you know, he recovers from that. But later on, we read that his pride comes back, and once his pride was overtaking his honor to God, they made him like an animal. They put him out in a pasture. He ate grass. He did not control his kingdom. He was kind of out of his mind, a little crazy for a while. And then finally he came to the realization that God is truly in control of all things. And once he did that, God restored him back to his kingdom. But you, now we're into 22, it says, But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although <coughs> you knew all this. And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives and your concubines, have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. So we see that Belshazzar learned nothing from his father. And he must have seen his father go crazy, live out in the wild. Uh, but I guess he just thought he could do better than his father and knew better than his father. And that's a lesson for all us young people that sometimes our father is wiser than we give him credit for. That means mom and dad. So as we read earlier in the chapter, everyone could see the hand writing in the plaster on the wall. Yeah. And what was written in the Bible, it tells us in verse 25, this was the inscription that the hand was writing. Mean, mean, tekel, Paris. I'm going to say it again. Mean, mean, tekel, Paris. And this is what each of those words mean. Mean, and this is right from the Bible. Verse 26, this is the interpretation of each word. Mean. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. 
parents, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Medes and the Persians. So the handwriting on the wall, God has finished your kingdom. You've you've been you've been weighed. We've looked at what you're doing and you're not doing it well. And so your kingdoms have been divided divided. And God divided between the Medes and the Persians. And this is another situation where we see this king is so arrogant and so prideful of everything as he has. He's got this great big party going on. He's using sacred uh, chalices and, and other pieces that were meant to be used only in the temple. And he's living it up in this party. What's going on outside his wall? Outside the entire city of Babylon is surrounded by the Medes and the Persians. So this king is so arrogant. He is not concerned about these two powerful armies getting ready to attack Babylon. He just thinks he can have a party and not worry about it. So they weren't trying to come to the party? No, no, no. They were coming to take over the country. Then Balthazar gave the command, and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler of the country. Now, Daniel allowed this because he knew that the kingdom was only going to last for a few more hours. We're not talking about days or weeks. We're talking a few more hours, probably less than four. That they might, that night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. We don't, the Bible doesn't tell us who slain, who killed him, but he was killed. And the Druids and the Medes received the kingdom, bringing about uh, 62 years of a new reign. So what we see happening is due to Belshazzar's dishonoring God, uh, God made him pay a terrible, terrible price. Not only was did he die, but his father's kingdom was taken. It was divided between Again, the Persians and the Medes. So the kingdom's divided in half. People are, you know, there's just all kinds of bad things that happen once one country invades another back in those days. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, I'm sure, were put in slavery. Uh, and we're going to uh, study more uh, about Daniel later on and some of the things the new rulers do. And, and we'll see none of it is good. But due to Belshazzar's arrogance, the leaders of Babylon all joining in and having, you know, uh, the desire to party and to uh, really uh, kind of make fun of who our, their, our holy God is by drinking uh, wine out of holy uh, goblets, as Julia was saying, uh, they were dishonoring God. And they were, uh, uh, I'm trying to find the word, but let's just leave it that they were dishonoring God. So today we learned several things. We always do. We learned that God gives us a reason to, to have confidence. God gave Daniel confidence as he was going to speak to the to the king gave God gave Daniel confidence as um, his he was he was um, asked to um, explain what this handwriting on the wall meant and he was in a position where he was having to tell the king something the king probably didn't want to hear God gave him the confidence to do that and in the end, Daniel wasn't prideful about it, saying, what a great negotiator I am. God, God, Daniel gives God all the glory because he knows that anything that he's able to do 
is because God has given him the skills, the time, the talents, the opportunity, and for all of that, God is, God is to receive the glory and the credit. Well, I think that's why Daniel rejected any worldly praise coming from the king. Right. He didn't need that because right. he had his relationship with God and he knew what God wanted him to do in his life. And as we've seen many times uh, in our study so far, Daniel stands for the Lord no matter what the situation is. He's steadfast in his faith and commitment to his holy God. So um, when we get boastful, <coughs> when we get prideful, and we get a little bragging about all the wonderful things we've done, and it were amazing person and all the things we've done that that may be true we may have done some very amazing things but we didn't do them on our own and when we describe those things and we take the credit and we don't give credit to God that is actually dishonoring God so this lesson is also there's an expression it's called pride goes before the fall and what we saw in this king in Belshazzar was that he's having a party. He's stealing from other people. He's using their, their valuable things to have a party. There's a war going on outside. He's having a party. And he's so prideful, even though he knows Daniel's history and what Daniel's relationship with God and what God has done for Daniel and his friends, this king knows those things. And he's still, he's kind of laughing in the face of God. And, and that's where this expression, pride comes before a fall. One must be very, very careful not to get too boastful. And as Christians, we must be very, very careful to remember that any good thing that we're able to contribute to is because God put us there, gave us the time, the talent, and the opportunity to do his work. And for that, we are very grateful, and we praise him. Yep, we, we always need to remember that by ourselves, we are nothing. We are just... Uh, we're sinful people. We have no talent other than what God gives us. God gives us the grace. He, whatever talents we have have come from God. We, when we study the Beatitudes, uh, that's part of it. So always keep in mind that uh, some of you may excel in certain areas, but you only in, excel in those areas because the Lord has permitted it and has guided those you in that direction. So with that, we'll have a, a word of prayer. Okay. And again, we just want to say we are so happy about uh, this Sunday and the fact that uh, the body can come together and worship. Uh, and what a joyous time that's going to be. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lesson and for the reminder that you, you give us so much opportunity, you give us talents, and we lift up with, with a chorus of thanks that you give us those opportunities and we give that credit to you, Lord. We know that our work is in your hands and we pray to you that the work we do is a work that you would have us do, Lord and that we use our talents and we use our time and opportunities to do your work, Lord. So we lift up with great praise that we have your word. We lift up with praise that, we, that you will give us reasons to have confidence to go forward and to spread your word. And we once again give great thanks that the situation with COVID has, has settled down enough that we're able to meet together again and we, we lift up Pastor Brian for the service and for all those in attendance. And with all of this, we say, Amen. Amen.